I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. I know uh, your time is valuable. We'll try to make the most of it. Uh, first, let me introduce our panel. Starting from my immediate left is Kathy Davis. Kathy Davis is a manager in our tax department. And scanning the crowd, I see a number of her clients here. Um, so if you don't know her already, you can uh, put a face to the name. Next to her is Mr. Lenz Christian. He's an attorney who works for us. He's also a manager in our tax department. He primarily works on our tax research matters, and he's also heavily involved in a lot of our international tax matters. And finally, uh, Ron Ruggieri. He's uh, my partner in charge of the tax department uh, for a short period of time. Um, he, uh, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, he's uh, really in, in charge of, of everybody here. First, a very quick disclaimer. Anytime we're talking about tax matters uh, in a forum such as this, we're talking on a very broad basis. Obviously, your particular tax situations might be different. If all the facts and circumstances are known, we might have conclusions that are different than the preliminary conclusions that we are reaching right now based solely on the Tax Act as enacted. Um, as Jim made reference to earlier, and as, as we will repeat ad nauseum, there is a profound lack of implementation guidance available at this point, uh, though we do expect it to be forthcoming. So as, as Mike said, the genesis of this act is it was rammed through uh, very late in December of 17. Uh, I don't think anybody at this table thought that the act could possibly pass in 17, but it did. Uh, and usually what happens with a tax act is that enough guidance comes out with the act for people to make some informed decisions as to what they want to do. Uh, not so with this act. Uh, it came through so quickly that a lot of big issues remain unresolved, especially in the qualified business deduction area, which we're going to be talking about extensively. So you're going to hear the words a lot during this seminar and as we go through the slides that this is unclear. Unclear not because we haven't researched it every which way we can. Unclear because the IRS has delayed putting out guidance on a lot of the major components of this particular act. Uh, they're promising to do so by the end of the summer, which would certainly give everybody enough time then to get their ducks in order uh, for 2018. Uh, whether or not that happens is, is still up in the air. So uh, it's just some be forewarned that there are planning opportunities. It is a good act for small businesses, as Jim said, but a lot of holes have to be filled in before we can move aggressively towards doing effective tax planning. Great. So just to dovetail uh, with, uh, with Ron's uh, exposition here, so uh, some major elements of the act, and by no means the list in front of you uh, is it exhaustive, but uh, these include a reduction of the tax rates uh, for businesses and for individuals, uh, personal tax simplification by way of increasing the standard deduction, eliminating personal exemptions, and making it less beneficial to itemize, a uh, limitation on the deduction for state and local income taxes and property taxes, which we'll address in some detail a bit down the road. Uh, a repeal <clears throat> of the uh, individual mandate under the ACA, that takes effect in 2019. And a shift of the uh, U.S. international tax regime to a so-called modified territorial system, which is, uh, that last point is worthy of a seminar uh, in itself. Uh, so, uh, the, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has done some uh, preliminary estimates, and you can see that the lion's share of the benefits under the Act adhere uh, to individuals and pass through entities like partnerships and S-corporations, although there are some uh, significant benefits uh, for corporations as well. And then, of course, the individual uh, tax cuts, the benefits uh, fade uh, over time. That was sunset date is, uh, starts to begin. Uh, sunset dates uh, start in 2026. Uh, just to, to, to put a little color on it, so I've, I've spoken to a few IRS representatives on the uh, open issues uh, in, in, in the, the Tax Act here, and what they've all told me, at least one specifically said that there will be, quote, a parsimony of notices. So when the IRS is going to finally issue guidance, it's going to be in the form <clears throat> of regs, uh, of regulations. It's not going to be notice of gap filling. A temporary provision. They really want to regulate, uh, get some time for notice and comment, and then finalize regulations. They're not looking to fill gaps. But as Ron said, the speed with which this act was blasted 
uh, through Congress uh, really sh shows that there's a, a lack of uh, good legislative history through which you can ferret out congressional intent and the drafting itself is in many places very ambiguous, leaves maybe too much room for interpretation uh, and that could lead to trouble for taxpayers down the road as will uh, be illustrated also a bit later. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the individual tax changes that came about with this act. Um, for the tax years beginning January 1st, 2018 and ending December 31st, 2025, there's still seven tax brackets. Um, the rates have changed. They go from a low of 10% to a high of 37%. Um, beginning January 1st, 2026, earlier tax rates will be in effect. Um, the highest rate is now for individuals with taxable income of 500,000 and above, which is up from 418.4, and for married couples filing jointly at 600,000 and above, which is up from 470.701. Um, yeah, so I'll, let me, if I can jump in for a second. Sure. I would just add that uh, the, uh, the rates uh, and their associated uh, inflation is tied now to the chain consumer price index as opposed to the standard. So I'm not an economist, but as I understand it, I mean, the chain CPI uh, is a measure of a basket of goods and services, uh, but accounting for substitutions. So there is, as a result of this um, uh, pegging to this uh, chain CPI, there's a slower rate of growth in prices, and economists predict that taxpayers will end up reaching the higher brackets a bit more quickly uh, because of this chain CPI measure. Thank you. So a little bit about capital gains. The basic capital gains structure is the same. Uh, Long-term capital gains are still taxed at 0%, 15%, and 20% brackets. And the short-term gains are taxed as ordinary income. And the 3.8% net investment income tax, also known as the Medicare tax, is still in place. <coughs> Regarding standard and itemized deductions, Beginning with 2018, the standard deduction for married joint filers has increased to 24,000. Head of household is 18,000, and everybody else is 12,000. The personal exemption has been eliminated. <coughs> also, the miscellaneous itemized deductions that exceed 2% of AGI are suspended, and there's some pretty big ones there for a lot of people. Um, they would be the investment advisory fees, the home office deductions, you have your tax preparation expenses, license and regulatory, and a whole host of other uh, deductions that you won't get at least until 2026, maybe. No. So I mean, I, I mean, I think that uh, at least as far as Congress is thinking is concerned, I it's logical you have an increase in the standard deduction and you lose the itemized deduction, so more people will start taking the standard deduction. I, yeah, uh, the likelihood of that is certainly increased, and um, some filers who usually itemize on their tax returns could see an increase in their taxes, um, especially if most of their income is taxed at ordinary rates versus capital gains rates. There could be a substantial increase in the tax liability due to the loss of those deductions. All right, <clears throat> let's turn to uh, mortgage interest briefly. So. Uh, the rules have changed a little bit. So for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017 and before January 1st, 2026, which we mentioned uh, is uh, the general sunset date for a lot of these individual tax provisions. Uh, the uh, deduction for uh, home equity indebtedness is suspended and the deduction for mortgage interest is limited to underlying debt of up to $750,000. Now, to go back for a second to this home equity indebtedness point. So uh, the IRS in a very cursory release in February clarified what this means. So if a home equity loan or a HELOC or something analogous to a home equity loan is used to buy, build, or substantially improve the home that secures that loan, then the interest is still deductible provided that the loan total doesn't exceed $750,000. So if you get a home equity uh, loan and you use it to pay off student loans or to purchase a vacation home, but it's secured not by that vacation home, but by, by your principal residence, uh, that loan won't qualify for a deduction of the home equity loan uh, interest indebtedness. But if you use it to build in addition to the main home, or you use it to buy a vacation home and you secure it with the vacation home, then that interest is still going to be deductible. So it's an important nuance that the IRS clarified back in February. Uh, this new lower limit uh, does not apply to any acquisition debt incurred before uh, December 15, 2017. Uh, and uh, as you can see there, if you enter into a binding written contract to close on uh, 
a principal residence before January 1st, 2018, and you in fact uh, purchased it uh, by April 1st, 2018, uh, then you will be uh, subject to the uh, earlier rules. Uh, the 1,500,000 limitations, they continue to apply to uh, refinancings, provided that that's accomplished before December 15th, 2017, and so long as the debt resulting from the refinancing doesn't exceed the refinance debt. All right, so state and local, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, <clears throat> very important, very controversial, uh, for many a very uh, painful uh, change. So for tax years again, beginning after December 31st, 2017, before January 20, uh, 1st, 2026, there's a new $10,000 cap on a deduction of certain state and local income, uh, local tax, federal income tax purposes. So all state and local income taxes are capped at 10,000, as are state and local property taxes that are not paid or accrued in carrying on or trade or business, which are combined within the $10,000 cap. Uh, there's no change in the deductibility of state and local income taxes paid by corporations. And this new cap uh, for individual deductions, again, for individual deductions, applies to income taxes paid directly with respect to income earned through pastor entities, like uh, a single member limited liability company partnership and so forth. Uh, so as you can see, Congress preserved the full deductibility of property taxes paid in carrying on a trader business, but not state and local income taxes, right? So all state and local income taxes are subject to this $10,000 cap. Foreign real property taxes may not be deducted under this $10,000 aggregate rule. Uh, in 2017, Congress anticipated that some taxpayers would want to prepay liability to get the deduction in 2017. Uh, generally, that was nipped in the bud uh, in the Act and in the conference report that clarified certain provisions within the Act. Uh, so, as I think some of you may have heard, it's fairly newsworthy, and New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut have made a big to-do about planning to sue uh, the federal government in connection with these uh, limits these severe limitations. Uh, so uh, I don't, I'm not aware that a lawsuit has been filed yet, but yes? Can you just clarify that um, you said that uh, the prepaying the taxes in 2017, can you talk about that a little bit more? So uh, the, the, the 2017 prepayment was, you, you had to actually pay for a 2017 liability. You could not pay 2018 liabilities in 17 to get the deduction. Okay, does that, that make sense? Yes, okay, makes sense. good, right. good question. <laughs> I think in practice how it works out is that if you have a property tax bill, the property tax bill would extend typically until the midpoint of the following year. Prepayment of the property tax would be deductible if it would otherwise have been deductible to you if you're not in the AMT or some other situation. Right, right. But prepayments of income taxes or other taxes that are based upon activity that had not happened yet and that had not been formally levied would not be deductible. Okay, that was sort of, that was a misunderstanding at towards the end of the year. <coughs> You know, you were hearing a lot of people doing that, taking paying certain taxes and what we control was property and was income tax and what that effect would have um, for the 2018. Right, and, and I think that, that the, the, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, but the real defining line is do you have a bill for the tax? Right. That's right. Do you so, actually have an assessment? Yeah, so right. if the tax has been levied, even if it's due at a future date, like your property taxes, then you could pay it in 2017 and benefit from the deduction when you're filing the 2017 taxes. Uh, if it's some other type of tax that you're choosing to prepay, you're, you're, you're out of luck. So you just gave the government an interest-free loan. Right. Right. So, yeah, so uh, the, I, I'm not aware that a lawsuit has actually been filed yet, and I, I, I question whether ever it will be, but it, it's out there. I guess they have to they have to make some noise for their constituents. So. Now, now Len, as our resident legal expert, um, <laughs> what do you uh, think the chances are that any lawsuit, if it was to be presented, could actually win. Uh, so, Ron and I talked about this, right? And mm -hmm. I think I asked him what percent, and what would you say? None of, is minus, none, zero. Is minus, minus zero. Minus zero is not a percent. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think it's a really very much a long shot because uh, generally courts are reluctant to put limits on Congress's ability to tax. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, and, and you know, all the permutations thereof. So I think that that lawsuit, assuming it's ever filed, is probably destined to be a loser. Yeah. the idea of states trying to set up some kind of charitable trust to pay into this trust? That's an excellent question, and that, that's, we're going to talk about that at the very end tonight. So I, I like the, uh, yeah, so it, it, We're going to let that yeah, anticipation Yeah, live. we're going to let it, yeah, let it <laughs> simmer a little bit, so, yeah. What's that? That's our ferment. That's a good word, too. That's right. So, uh, 
So a great question, and, and certainly we'll address it. Uh, so the, uh, the biggest change uh, impacting small business owners is uh, likely going to be this new qualified business income, this QBI deduction. We're just going to frame it here. We're not going to get into, in, into the, the weeds so much just at the moment, but uh, it's a deduction for the uh, pass-through businesses, the S-corporations, the partnerships, the sole proprietorships, the limited liability companies, taxes, partnerships, or taxes disregarding entities, and their pass-throughs, as you know, because all items of income, deduction, revenue, credit, uh, they, they all flow uh, through to the ultimate owners of those pass-through entities proportionately to be taxed at individual rates. So you contrast this with the classic C-corporation, uh, where you have, um, certainly C-corporations can, for example, deduct the salaries of their employees. But the earnings that those corporations accumulate later on when they're uh, paid as dividends to the shareholders, uh, those shareholders have to pay tax on the dividends. So that's the, the double tax trap of the C corporation. Uh, so there are significant limitations on the availability of the uh, QBI deduction, uh, specifically uh, in connection with businesses such as accounting, consulting law, and other similar professional services. So the rationale for excluding them, uh, I mean, it depends on certainly on who you talk to, but. Uh, the, the, the conception is that legislators uh, enacting this, this QBI piece, they believe that these professions don't really employ that many people, and uh, the ones who are successful in these professions, they make way too much money. So they should not be entitled to the same tax breaks as manufacturers or retailers, for example. Uh, so the, the QBI uh, deduction is really incentivizing hiring and it's rewarding business owners uh, in certain industries uh, to hire. So if we can just get into some of the other business provisions before we get back to the QBI. Uh, there has been a big drop in the corporation tax rate, meaning the C corporation tax rate, from a high of 35% now to a flat 21%. And whereas in the past we always used to discourage people from operating as a C corp, now we're starting to see some questions, well, if the C corp rate is 21 and the individual rate is 37. Shouldn't I convert my S corporation to a C corporation? It's not really a flat 21 percent. It's a flat 21 percent corporate tax rate. But if that C corp then pays out dividends to its shareholders, that dividend would be subject to an individual tax rate at 20 percent, and it would also be subject to the Medicare tax at 3.8 percent. So when you go through this calculation, that kind of corporation, a C corporation, would really be paying a 39.8% rate versus a possible 296 for a pass-through entity if you qualified for the QBI, which Len will talk about in great detail in a little bit. So, you know, there might be some isolated instances where it would be beneficial to convert corporations not so much partnerships, but S corporations to C corporations, but I, I would think that those, those instances are very, very limited and would require a lot of analysis. Uh, the corporate AMT is no more, gone, and anyone who is, any C corp that has accumulated AMT credits can now obtain refunds on a calculated amount for those stored credits. Uh, in a big effort to improve capital investment, the write-offs of business equipment have been expanded greatly. We now have two separate provisions. One, 100% bonus depreciation for new and for the first time used equipment if it's placed in service before uh, January 1st, 2023. And then after that, it drops in 20% in integrals until 2026. Uh, there's also an increased expensing under Section 179, where you can write off the cost of certain property in full, not depreciate it, write it off in full, and that limit has now been expanded up to $1 million, uh, as long mm -hmm. as your total capital acquisitions are less than $2.5 million. If they're more than $2.5 million, the $1 mm -hmm. million gets uh, reduced pro rate. Ron, I'm sorry, I just want to maybe uh, define qualified mm -hmm. property. Uh, so you made a point about bonus depreciation. So that, that term is in quotes because it's defined uh, so statutorily. So that's tangible personal property with a recovery period of 20 years or less, uh, certain qualified improvement property, water utility property, and certain software. And the 
Concomitantly, you have this qualified real property uh, for uh, 179 purposes. That's also defined. So this is qualified improvement property. So these are your improvements to building interiors, your HVAC property, fire alarms, security systems, and roofs. So, you know, with these two provisions, the 100% bonus <coughs> depreciation or the million dollar expensing under 179, taxpayers have a choice of which one they want to use. Uh, there are subtle differences between the two, though, even though you might think you're getting to the same result. Under Section, 17, Section 179 cannot be used to create a tax loss. Bonus depreciation can create a tax loss. So that might be one reason why you would be leaning towards bonus depreciation. Uh, conversely, there's state issues you also have to take into account, that some states will allow Section 179, specifically New York, uh, but not allow bonus depreciation. So you really have to analyze it uh, on a, a situation by situation, state by state basis to see where you get the best benefit on a combined federal and state uh, basis. And I'd also like to add to that that taxpayers that have real property assets may want to consider at this time doing cost segregation study so as to be able to expense components of those assets. Uh, this is a new provision, uh, brandy new actually. Uh, everybody that has a pass-through entity, their main goal is to be able to generate a loss in that entity to shelter other income. But there's a lot of hurdles that you have to go over to have a deductible loss that shelters other income. You have to have enough basis in that entity. You have to be at risk in that entity. You have to materially participate under the passive activity rules. Once you pass those three hurdles and you have a loss, in the past, that loss then could be used to offset other income on your return, wages, dividends, capital gains, whatever. Well, we have now have this new concept called an excess business loss, which effectively says that in any tax year, you can only deduct, if you're single, $250,000 of otherwise allowable losses against other income, or on a joint return, 500,000. And it's not done on a entity, it's not done on an entity by entity basis. All of your pass through activity is combined to get to that $250,000 or $500,000 threshold. Once you exceed the 250 or 500, the excess gets carried forward to the succeeding year, but it gets carried forward as an NOL, subject to its own limitations. So if we could just look through one very simple example, maybe it'll become a little bit clearer, that we have this person, Joe, who's single. He has $300,000 of interest and capital gain income. In addition to that, he owns a business, a pass-through business, that has gross income of 200,000 and deductions of 500. So that business has generated a net loss of $300,000. Prior to 2018, that $300,000 loss would be utilized against the $300,000 of non-business income from interest and capital gains, effectively dropping his adjusted gross income to zero. 2018 and forward, he can only use 250 of that $300,000 loss, so he remains with $50,000 of adjusted gross income. The, the other 50 that he has not been able to use in 2018 carries forward and becomes subject to the NOL rules that Len is going to talk about in the next slide. So you're not losing that excess, you just can't use it currently. Ron, that's a non-business, so if you have one business that makes a million dollars last year with one that loses a million, they can offset? They can offset. Right. So uh, the uh, changes to the NOL rules, so for, again, NOLs rising after uh, December 31st, 2017, the two-year carryback rule is repealed, uh, and uh, the deduction is going to be limited to 80% of taxable income. Uh, the carry-forward is now uh, indefinite. Uh, I guess you have to query how useful that is to trouble companies now uh, before they could just go back two years, get a quick refund, get enough cash to keep going. 
uh, that option uh, you know, is, is kind of out the window. Uh, so uh, it's not quite clear, uh, but again, the NOLs from earlier years are ostensibly not subject to this new rule. So it looks like you're going to have to track them separately uh, and see what can be used as you move into subsequent years. Again, this is one of those points where IRS guidance is expected. Uh, so the, the bottom bullet refers to the famous uh, like-kind exchange under Code Section 1031. Uh, it's the rule that allows for the deferral of gain on like-kind exchanges of property. That's modified to allow for like-kind exchanges only of investment real property. Before, you could like-kind exchange a lot of things, uh, intangibles, uh, collectibles, Picassos, all your, all your paint, paintings and art. Uh, you can no longer do that uh, after December 31st, 2017, although there is a transition rule for per exchanges of personal property, uh, provided that you either relinquish the property or acquire replacement property before December 31st, 2017. All right, returning to QBI. So again, uh, as we go through these slides, you'll see a lot of dense and uh, obfuscatory language. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. I think when we get to the examples, uh, I, I think a lot of it will, will be much clearer. We just wanted to, to, to frame the actual uh, statutory language and interpretation for you here. So, uh, for QBI, non-corporate taxpayer, including the trust or estate, has qualified business income from a partnership as corporation sole proprietorship, is potentially allowed to deduct up to 20% of that QBI. Now, there's no statutory definition of what QBI is, as far as I know. So, uh, I, generally, it's thought of as, you know, your non-investment ordinary income. Uh, so, there is a limitation in connection uh, with QBI that's based on wages paid or on wages paid plus a so-called capital element, but only above certain taxable income thresholds, which we're also going to get to. The deduction is phased in for taxpayers with taxable income uh, above a threshold amount, but below a cap, which is a $50,000 cap for individuals and a $100,000 cap for joint filers. Len, can you give us a little bit of insight as to how that 3.8% uh, net investment income tax interplays with the QBI deduction? Yeah, I don't think I don't know if Ron disagrees, but I think that it's a uh, I, I don't think it's applicable. I don't think it. Uh, right. Yeah. So the, the twenty percent reduction that would be available is not going to be available in calculating your three point eight percent tax. I think that's less unclear than anything else. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so this is uh, again one of the thorniest areas of the of the whole reform, uh, and certainly of QBI. Uh, so this is the specified service trader business limitation. So the QBI deduction is not available to the so-called white-collar professions, the consulting, the financial advisory, medicine, law, accounting, and the like, but also athletics, performing arts, and fundamentally, underscored it for emphasis, of course, uh, any trader business where the principal asset is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. Now, query just for the, for the moment, what business is not dependent upon the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. And we'll get back to this point a little bit later. Note that <coughs> engineering and architectural uh, services were excluded from the, this language, kind of a last minute change. But <coughs> the language itself is based on section 1202 of the Internal Revenue Code, which deals with sale of so-called small business stock and the preferential gain afforded there too. So it's really uh, curious that the IRS in private letter rulings uh, in connection with section 1202 has taken a relatively broad approach as to what business is qualified, i.e. not a specified service trader business for section 1202. So for example, there was a 2017 private letter ruling where a company that generated uh, sophisticated medical reports for doctors was deemed uh, to uh, not be in a specified service trader business, even though it was ostensibly in the medical field and providing a medical service. The IRS didn't address whether it was a medical service or not. It said, well, these reports, they had nothing to do with the skill of the company's employees, which was a very, very curious conclusion. Now, my suspicion is that the IRS will not be as generous in interpreting QBI under the new section 199 Cap A as it is, or at least as it has been, uh, in interpreting section uh, 1202. Uh, so, again, you see there at the bottom, you have this limitation for service businesses. Now, understand that you're excluded if you're a successful service business, very successful, right? So, if your income is below, uh, your taxable income is below these thresholds, this uh, 157.5 and 315, subject to a phase-in with uh, the applicable cap, uh, you're fine. You get the, the benefit of the full deduction. But if you are over, you get nothing, okay? So, that's very, very important. So, Len, if... Uh 
if my business happens to generate four hundred and fifteen thousand and one dollars for the year, and I'm totally locked out of the QBI deduction, what kind of steps uh, would you recommend that that people look into uh, as they're approaching your end? Um, you could buy equipment for the business, contribute to a retirement plan. I don't know if any, if any any other suggestions. I mean, I know, Kathy, if you or Ron, if you have any others, but I mean, I think those are probably the, the easiest ones to accomplish. So, you could pay your account. You can pay your account. That's right. Business, that's right. That's absolutely right. So just to, to backtrack for a second, uh, one thing that uh, I uh, also gleaned from uh, you know some various panels I was uh, on and, and that I attended with the IRS, uh, that uh, the regulation process for QBI will be, quote, difficult. So uh, you know uh, they, they say that the regulations will be out uh, by the summer. Uh, whether that means July or the early September, I can't tell, but uh, they say it will be a difficult process. And you can see just by these definitions, you can get a taste of why those difficulties um, are so manifest. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, QBI, we do not talk about, uh, we do not include, excuse me, uh, certain investment items like reasonable compensation paid to the taxpayer. Uh, this is in the context of an S corporation paying a salary to its shareholders like it's required or guaranteed payments to partners under Code Section 707C and payments under Code Section 707A. It's in exchange for services. Uh, the critical limitation is the one below. So again, you don't have to worry about this language because it'll become clear in the example, but understand that the limitation is, okay, if again, if you are above the thresholds and the cap, right, the limitation is gonna be the lesser of, stop, right, 20% of QBI or the greater of the two limitations there, 50% of the W-2 wages paid by the business or <clears throat> the sum of 25% of the W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of all qualified property. So it's tangible depreciable property held by and available for use uh, in the business. Uh, the depreciable period uh, for that property begins on the date that it's first placed into service and ends up later of 10 years after that date or the last day of the full year of the, uh, last full year, excuse me, of the uh, recovery period. Len, a little earlier, uh, Ron had mentioned that uh, one of the goals was to uh, try to increase hiring activity. Um, looking at these factors for the uh, greater than or less than test that we talked about right. above, yeah. how does that affect an employer's decision as to whether somebody should be retained on an independent contractor basis versus an employee basis? Well, I think it becomes significant if you're above the thresholds. Um, so if you're, if you're above the threshold and you have a lot of 1099s uh, that you're issuing, you have a lot of independent contractors and consultants uh, working ad hoc for you, you may want to consider putting some of them on payroll if you want to avail yourself of the benefit of this deduction. Because it's a lesser of test, if you don't pay any wages, <coughs> you're not going to get the benefit of the deduction. Now, of course, there are competing concerns, obviously, but if you're looking at a potentially enormous deduction, uh, you, you should seriously consider putting, uh, putting people on payroll. Presuming you're over those income. Presuming, of course, you're over the threshold. If you're not, you can stay status quo. Len, if we can just clarify <clears throat> that 2.5% of unadjusted basis so everybody's clear, what that means, it, it's 2.5% of the original cost of the depreciable property, not reduced by <coughs> depreciation, not reduced by any 179. So you're doing this 2.5% calculation on the original quote, which is a benefit to the taxpayer, obviously, on the on two and a half percent of the original cost, even though on your books you're showing a net book value, that net book value does not come into this calculation. It's original cost. Thank you. Uh, so for losses, uh, this is again one of those areas where uh, the QBI determination is unclear. So we're just citing a, a few uh, sections from this new 199 Cap A to get a sense of. Uh, how, how we might shake out on losses. So uh, 199 cap A uh, C2, if you have the net amount of qualified income gain deduction and loss uh, with respect to a qualified trader business for any tax payer is less than zero, uh, you have a loss, right, uh, in the next tax year. Uh, the statute isn't clear on how to net. There is a provision, a subsection, that says the combined qualified business income amount is an amount equal to the sum of amounts uh, determined consistent with the uh, limitations for each qualified trader business carried on by the taxpayer. So, that language, along with some language in the conference report, appears to contemplate current year netting, but again, it's not statutory, and there's no interpretive guidance uh, that says that's indeed the case. Uh, there's also no guidance in connection with 
uh, taking into account the, the wage limitation and the uh, unadjusted basis of property limitations in connection with losses. So uh, for partners and shareholders, uh, you have to be cognizant of your share of any W-2 wages that are paid by uh, the pass-through uh, that you're involved in. So if you're a partner, you're allocable share. If you're an S-corp, you're pro-rata share. So if you're a 10% partner, a million dollars of wages are paid. I mean, your share is going to be you know, $100,000 of those W-2 wages that are used in calculating your particular QBI. Again, subject to the phase. Let's turn maybe to a few examples that hopefully will put some, uh, some color on this uh, pretty colorless language. So. And we tried to make these as simple as possible yeah, sure. just so you get the feel for you know, how these calculations are going to work. Obviously, they're not going to be this simple in real life. But in the first example, we have a person, Tom, who is a lawyer in a law firm, which is a specified service business. His taxable income is $100,000 and he has $100,000 of pass-through income from that law firm. His deduction is 20% of $100,000 or $20,000. We don't have to get involved with any of those other limitations because he's underneath the threshold of 157.5. There's nothing else you need to look at. Conversely, we have Mitch, who's a neurosurgeon, again, a specified service business. He has $500,000 of taxable income. Because he's in a specified service business and because he's over the threshold and the cap, for him the absolute ceiling would be $415,000 or two hundred seven five dollars if he was single. Because he's over both of those caps, there's no deduction. Again, you don't have to get into that alternate calculation because in a specified service business, once you're over the threshold and the cap, you get no deduction. A little bit more variance in Natasha. She has $200,000 of net income from her Schedule C, but her taxable income is only one fifty dollars because she has $50,000 of unrelated deductions which have reduced her taxable income from 200 to 150. So here when you look at the calculation, again because she's underneath the threshold and the caps, we're not worried about the W-2 or the unadjusted basis calculation. Here her tentative deduction is 200,000 times 20 percent or 40,000. However, because her taxable income is only 150, the QBI deduction is calculated on her taxable income of 150 instead of the 200, giving her a QBI deduction of 30,000 and not 40. And then finally, an example where we get into the alternate calculation, and hopefully you can follow this. Uh, we've got Dan who operates a factory which is not a specified service business has $100,000 of QBI and taxable income of a million dollars. Now, because he's over the threshold and the cap, we have to use that alternate calculation. He gets to use the alternate calculation because his business is not a specified service business. So the tentative deduction for Dan would be 20% of $100,000 or $20,000. But because he's over the threshold and the cap, you have to use that other calculation. So you first look at 50% of W-2 wages. The factory pays $30,000 of wages. 50% of that is $15,000. You then go to the second leg of that alternate calculation where you take 25% of the W-2 wages. 25% of 30,000 is 7,500 and 2.5% of the original cost of his equipment, 2.5% of 400,000 is 10,000. The sum of those two is 17.5. So the way the, and it, I know it sounds strange, but the deduction is limited to the greater of, the lesser of, the 
$20,000 that we originally calculated or the greater of the fifteen or the seventeen five, his QBI deduction is seventeen thousand five hundred. Ron, if somebody's involved in uh, the real estate business, say renting real property, would they be able to avail themselves of the QBI deduction? It depends, and uh, in order for, I believe, you know, there, there's been nothing you know in writing about this particular provision, but in order to get the QBI deduction what you're doing has to rise to the level of a trader business. So some real estate, renting of real estate rises to that level. For instance, if you own a commercial building that has 50 tenants, probably that rises to the level of a trader business and you're eligible for the 20% deduction on that pass-through income. Conversely, no matter what the rent, if, and I'll just tell you a story, a true story. I don't know how many of you might have read this in the post yesterday, but there's this person on this reality TV show. You know, I don't know her name, my, my staff knows her name. Bethany Frankel. Frank Bethany Frank Frankel. Frank That's her name. And I was reading in the post that she rents or is renting her house in Bridgehampton starting June 1st through September 30th for $150,000 a month. So I think that comes out to $600,000. If she came to me and asked me, do I qualify for the QBI, I think I would be forced to say no. I think that no matter what the gross rental income is, if you only have a single tenant and a single rental property that that does not rise to the level of a trade or business, which would make it eligible for the QBI. So I, I'm, we're hoping for guidance on this, but I think that's the way it's going to probably shake out. Yeah, and, 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 and certain uh, trade groups, for example, the American Institute of uh, CPAs, I mean, they uh, they specifically asked that the IRS issue some guidance in connection with the real estate related parameters of the QBI. So. Okay, so I'm going to just give a rundown and summary of the QBI rules and the threshold tiers. So in the first tier, we have taxable income equal to or less than 157.5 for singles or 315 for married couple filing jointly. Your QBI deduction is equal to 20% of your share of trade or business income from pass-through entities. This applies to all businesses, doesn't matter what kind of business it is. In the second tier, if you fall between 157.5 and 207.5 for singles, or 315 to 415 for married filing jointly, um, there are special phase out rules. That also applies to all businesses. Then in the third tier, if your taxable income exceeds the applicable threshold and corresponding caps, so that would be the 415 married filing joint, single 207.5, then the QBI deduction only applies to qualified trade or business income and is limited to the calculation that Len and Ron were just talking about, the 20% of QBI or the greater 50% of W-2 wages versus 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the cost of property. Also in the third tier, if your income is over 415 married filing jointly or 2075 single, and you're in a specified service business, there's no deduction. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll sound the note of caution for those who are eager to claim this deduction. So as some of you, but uh, hopefully not too many of you know, uh, there's a accuracy related penalty under the Internal Revenue Code, right? Uh, and that penalty is equal to 20% of any underpayment of tax resulting from a so-called substantial understatement of income tax. And substantial understatement is the amount of tax required to be shown on a return is understated by the greater of 10% or $5,000. The QBI uh, statute, right, 199 Cap A in one of its subsections, there's a provision that reduces this accuracy-related penalty threshold to the greater of 5% or $5,000 in the case of any taxpayer that claims the deduction. What does that mean? That means that even if the understatement does not result from the deduction, right, you are still subject to the accuracy-related penalty. 
this is a very, uh, very thorny and uh, potentially painful uh, result for clients here because uh, you have, uh, first of all, a substantial understatement. The threshold is lower, right? So you're more likely to hit that understatement. And then that understatement is going to be in excess of the 5% threshold. So you're going to be hit with the penalty. So uh, when you claim the deduction uh, in the absence of guidance, you should be pretty confident that um, it's supportable, sustainable, because if you if you get hit with this penalty, you, you're really up against it. Now you're looking for abatement, reasonable cause, and there's just an absence of authority to look to. Uh, so, I, at least at this point. So, uh, I think that uh, this is an important note of caution to sound with the, your colleagues, your clients, your, and yourselves, uh, that uh, QBI is certainly beneficial, but if you claim it improperly, uh, there could be a very painful uh, penalty hit as a result. Uh, so, some interesting implications and questions in connection with, uh, with QBI. Uh, so, to go back to uh, our earlier point, uh, what constitutes a business where the principal asset is the reputation and skill of one or more employees? And I put, you know, would plumbing qualify on the slide there? So, that's not facetious, right? That was actually an uh, a example, uh, again, on a, on a panel we had a very seasoned, uh, very smart, very, uh, you know, very wise IRS uh, chief counsel representative. And he was asked this question, would plumbing qualify? And he very nonchalantly waved it off and said, the income limits will take care of that. No worries. And this was, <laughs> this was a New York City uh, uh, panel. And the, uh, one of the other panelists said, you don't know how much my plumber charges me in the city. Uh, so, <laughs> and that actually came back to bite him on a subsequent panel that he attended where someone said, what about those income limits? So he, had to, he actually kind of was contrite about having said that. So uh, it really is, uh, it, it's very, difficult right now to ascertain who exactly will be uh, operating in a specified service trader business and in turn will be disqualified from receiving the deduction. Uh, because ostensibly a plumber uh, has reputation and skill uh, and uh, his income is predicated upon uh, that reputation and skill. So well, I guess he would be denied the deduction right? if he makes uh, money over the threshold. So uh, something to uh, keep in mind, something that the IRS really needs to weigh in on. Uh, another important uh, point is this area of um, multiple activities in a single business. So you have an optometrist selling glasses. Well, the provision of optometry could potentially be, probably is, uh, a medical service. Uh, but selling glasses is not a specified service trader business. So the question is, how do you group uh, QBI generating activities? Uh, and how do you bifurcate uh, those activities that are uh, a part of that QBI generating business, but, but, may, but are not strictly that? Uh, is there some sort of functional interdependence test? Is there uh, a common control and ownership, predominant purpose, uh, purely ancillary activities test? Uh, that's, again, something that uh, guidance is, uh, is sorely needed. Uh, one thing that's important is that the IRS has said that uh, if it sees some sort of arrangement in a business and that arrangement is a contrivance to get the deduction, the IRS will collapse the arrangement, uh, eliminate the deduction, and probably hit you with a 20%. Uh, Accuracy-related penalty. Uh, so it's uh, something also to keep in mind. You know, Len, I think that this might be a big issue for a, a number of our clients and a number of businesses generally. Uh, do you have any indication as to when we'll be getting more information on this and <coughs> what what form those will take? So, so the last word uh, that I had from from Chief Counsel was um, about two weeks ago, and they said summer. Okay, they couldn't would not get any more specific than that, but they said summer there will be regulations out, uh, but. You have to assume that there's going to be a period for notice and comment um, in connection with those regulations. And so finalization of those regs uh, is still very much up in the air, but at least we'll have something to look at uh, that we can rely on for uh, a position you know, for this taxable year uh, by hopefully the end of summer. They wouldn't get any more specific than summer. But clearly it was part of their priority guidance plan. Uh, it's something they're very much focused on, uh, and you have to hope that they will actually end up meeting that deadline. Uh, <clears throat> Complexity of partnership and S-corporation filings uh, likely magnified, so K-1s will probably have to include information for each qualified trader business carried on by the pass-through entity, as well as information on, as to whether or not it's a specified service trader business or some component of it might be, uh, the W-2 wages paid by that pass-through, and the depreciable asset basis, so the individual partners, uh, LLC members, that they could uh, calculate their applicable share of the QBI deduction. Uh, I think this might present a problem for some uh, partnerships, uh, some entities that are not too prompt to on the ball with issuing K-1s uh, to, uh, to their partners, to their members. One thing I will say is that some of the more sophisticated partnerships 
this year uh, in connection with the repatriation tax, the transition tax, which is part of the, um, uh, the tax reform, very important part, uh, and which has been the focus of IRS guidance so far. Uh, the, those partnerships fairly quickly uh, did the necessary calculations and issued K-1s showing the partner's share of that transition tax. Um, so uh, I, I like to think that uh, those same kinds of partnerships, to the extent that QBI, uh, that they're in a, that they're generating QBI and for their, uh, the partners and the members, that uh, they will make the requisite calculations and provide the information uh, timely as well to the members and partners. Uh, so. The uh, potential restructuring of LLCs and partnerships. So we mentioned briefly that um, uh, QBI does not include uh, compensation uh, paid to uh, guaranteed payments uh, paid to partners, uh, payments uh, made to partners for services. So I think as many of you are aware, a lot of professional service LLCs partnerships like law firms, you have the capital partner and you have the, uh, uh, the income partners, the non-equity partners. Uh, who chiefly receive guaranteed payments. So I'm not saying this will be a systemic shift in the way these kinds of professional service companies are operating, but it, it's, it's, it's a consideration. Uh, it's certainly a consideration. Uh, the reasonable compensation issue, again, as corporations must pay reasonable compensation to their shareholders. There's some audit risk, uh, I think, <coughs> where uh, a, a reduction in QBI will include the compensation paid and recharacterization of so-called qualified business income as reasonable compensation. So you're going to have uh, you're going to be forced to pay that reasonable comp, and you're going to get a um, uh, a hit on the deduction that you would otherwise be entitled to. So another salient point for um, those of you who are in S corps or uh, considering uh, becoming shareholders in S corporations. And for PEOs, I think uh, I think Kathy has a, a comment, right? Yeah. But, uh, please, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just going to yeah, mention something about the AICPA also uh, soliciting uh, the IRS to please weigh in on the PEO issue, saying that, well, uh, provided that the uh, outsourced employees uh, of a uh, employer otherwise engaged in a qualified trader business, providing they're rendering substantially full-time services to that employer, well, they should be entitled to the deduction, even though the payor of those wages is the PEO. So I, I don't know, Kathy, if you have a, a, th a different thought. Well, hopefully that. that guidance will be forthcoming soon, because I yeah. think that letter went out in February. Yeah, yeah, a while back. That's issued right. early. Yep. Um, under the law for the former domestic production activities deduction, um, taxpayers were permitted to take into account W-2 wages that were paid and reported by another entity, as long as those wages were paid to employees of the taxpayer for employment by the taxpayer. So entities that have multiple operations and have a separate company set up just as a common paymaster to pay all the employees of those other entities. Um, the wages were allowed to be allocated for purpose of the W-2 limitation, even if the wages were paid by that separate entity. A similar provision would provide relief for those seeking a deduction under Code Section 199A, but at present it doesn't look like that would reflect congressional intent for that particular section. There's also the question of whether the reported wages need to match the identifying information of the employer and not the payer in order to be deductible. Right. Again, you have that issue. You have the, the employer's identifying information versus the PEOs. So if it's not an exact reporting match, then uh, it could be uh, the, the, claim the, the employer claims the deduction, but uh, it doesn't match the W-2 wages paid by the PEO, the common paymaster. So that could present the problem, too. Right. So the concern is that they would have no ability to take the QBI deduction because they essentially have no employees, they have no employees. even if they have a 1,000 people working. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I thought David had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Do <coughs> so you have a, an LLC that's a professional LLC, and you have uh, K-1 income that comes out, no guaranteed payments. So every single, every single part of the member works, no guaranteed payments, and some of them get income of $200,000, $250,000. So even though it's a specified service, it's a law firm. What's the risk that the IRS says, well, wait a minute, some of the income has to be recharacterized as compensation for services, even though it's not classified as guaranteed payment, but everyone simply gets a percentage of the income at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, probably, I mean, I, don't, I think it's non trivial, but I, 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 there is a uh, reasonable compensation doesn't include payments made to partners in exchange for services either, right? Under 707C, so I, I think the, I think that's a substantial risk. I mean, just based on what you described. 
Yeah, so uh, it's not just guaranteed payments, it's also payments in exchange for services. So it's sub A and sub C. Yeah, so that's, that's basically every service entity. It doesn't have to your partners or to your owners. Right, right, that, that, yeah, that, uh, that, that, that's right. That, and then, of course, the, you know, if you're below the threshold, then so the, the thresholds will come into play too. But if you're a specified service trader business, I mean, you have to be very cognizant of how much money you're making. So. <laughs> That and then in the S corp, it's query that thing. That's right. You got this somewhat of a dichotomy. You got to deal with. That's right. That's right. So uh, regarding state law conformity and the QBI, um, the QBI deduction reduces taxable income, but not AGI or adjusted gross. So it's going to flow through only in states that start their taxable income calculations with federal taxable income. Um, Colorado would be one of those, but they might decouple from the deduction anyway. New Jersey will not allow QBI deduction. The taxable income there is determination is determined by statute. statute. Um, and New York's personal income tax calc starts with federal AGI, so no QBI deduction is going to be allowed there either. For expensing, under, under federal code um, section 179 and the bonus depreciation provisions, the cost of certain business assets can be fully depreciated in the year in which they're placed in service. Um, many states already decouple from federal 179 and the bonus provisions, so they'll automatically decouple from the new expensing rules unless they state otherwise. New York conforms with federal section 179 and should end up conforming with the new limits. Um, they don't allow bonus depreciation, as a side note. New Jersey does not conform to either federal rules for 179 or a bonus. So uh, another interesting provision under Section 118 of the, the tax code, uh, before uh, contributions to a corporation's capital uh, by a government entity, uh, they were uh, those contributions were not taxable. Uh, now uh, they are. So other than an exchange for stock, so a transaction under 351 of the tax code um, where you, you know, capitalize an entity, uh, that, that's, that remains tax-free. But if you, for example, have a, um, a government agency that uh, grants money to a corporation to build some kind of uh, elder care facility or some other uh, necessary, um, uh, necessary construction project, those grants are going to be taxable to the corporation. And states may uh, indeed decouple from this provision as well because they'll think it's inconsistent potentially with their economic development policies. So just an interesting uh, change as well. And finally, we get to one of the questions that was asked uh, about the workarounds in connection with state and local uh, income taxes and the limitations on deductibility of those taxes. So uh, states like New York, uh, they are attempting these workarounds. And I think New York in its budget uh, bill recently passed uh, they passed this optional employer payroll tax. Uh, other uh, states like New Jersey, I think uh, Ron might, might be able to speak to this too, uh, some townships have set up these charitable trusts uh, where uh, individuals could uh, make a uh, voluntary contribution and therefore uh, offset you know, a significant percentage of their property taxes by taking a deduction for that quote unquote charitable contribution on their federal income tax return. Uh, the employer payroll tax uh, I think has some precedent, has some foundation, other, other townships have, have done something of, of the sort. Uh, I think that the charitable trusts are very unlikely to be respected uh, by the government, uh, and indeed the, um, the Secretary of the Treasury has called them, quote, ridiculous. So it seems like, uh, it seems very unlikely that the government is just going to take this lying down, so to speak. I, I think that they will definitely uh, challenge these kinds of arrangements and deny any deductions associated with these so-called voluntary charitable contributions to these entities set up specifically for the purpose of you know, getting a break on your property taxes. So you, you question what the charitable purpose is, you question the donative intent, I mean you question a lot of things uh, in connection with the deductibility of such contributions. So I think it's, it's quite a gamble. When you look at uh, payroll taxes that have been uh, implemented in the past that have been allowable for federal deduction purposes, I think an important thing to remember is that they were paid by the employers, not by the employees. Right. So if you look at the city of Newark, they have, a, they have a gross wages tax. That's paid at the employer level, not at the individual level. So it's deductible by the corporation. It doesn't affect the individual's uh, income tax. So the types of plans that I've heard bandied about, uh, the payroll tax should be paid by the individual. So how is that payroll tax? Right, right, right. Kind of defeats the entire right. Right, definition. Yeah. And uh, 
I think that's it. Um, I hope uh, everyone got something out of this. If uh, You'll join me really quickly just to thank uh, Kathy, Len, and Ron for, for all their work in putting this together. Um, just, just to add real quick, I mean, the, uh, the appendix that we started to cycle through, this is just that we'll make these slides available, uh, but to, this is just a handy reference for the tax brackets and for QBI qualification. So it might be something you want to have by your bedside when you're <laughs> con contemplating these issues. Right. And, so, so the slide decks will be available on our website uh, within a day or so. If anybody wants a copy emailed to them, uh, just hand us your business card and write that you want the slides on it, and somebody will email them out to you probably tomorrow. If anybody here uh, is a CPA and needs CPE credits for this, uh, provide us with your contact information as well. We'll send out CPE certificates to the attendees that, that get some benefit out of that.